Hello, hello. हेलो Yeah, good evening and welcome everybody. So today, so we are happy to welcome you the popular talk series presented by Dr. TMA Pi Planetarium and Manipal Center for Natural Sciences Center of Excellence and Ayuka Center for Astronomy Research and Development. So we are very happy to have Professor Parachantran uh, Satyapalan. So let me briefly introduce the professor. So he got the BTEC from IIT Delhi in 1979. And then he obtained PhD from Caltech in 1983. And then he, had, he did postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania and the UCLA. Then he had teaching position at Penn State University. After that, he came back to India and joined the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in 1996. And he has been there since then. And he's now a honorary professor at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences since 2020. So because uh, he works on, in the field close to myself, uh, yeah, I'm familiar, quite familiar with his uh, work. And I always uh, had uh, respect that his work is uh, very um, ahead of time. So, yeah, I, I like his, he looks like he's uh, enjoying what he wants to do in his research and his work is very original. And because of that, I sometimes feel his uh, research work is not 
as well known as it should be, although he's, he's a well-known researcher. So today he'll be talking about black hole holography and quantum gravity. So let us welcome the Professor Satya Palang. Okay. So I'd like to thank uh, Professor Furuchi for a nice uh, introduction and welcome. And I'm also happy to be here. And uh, this is my first uh, extended visit to Manipal, particularly the center. And it seems like a very nice place to uh, focus on your research. So I'm uh, happy to be here and give this talk. So uh, this was announced as a popular talk. So uh, when I first uh, suggested a talk to Professor Furuchi, I thought I would give a technical talk. Then he said it would be better to, because of many students, to give a popular talk. So I picked a, a topic which is close to what I work in. But I will not be able to spend uh, time explaining what I'm doing. So instead of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of some of the issues that are of interest in this area and what, what guides uh, the researchers in this. What, what is the aim? What is the goal? So uh, basically, the talk is going to be about uh, quantum gravity. By quantum gravity, uh, we mean a theory of gravity which incorporates quantum mechanics. Okay? So that's the goal. and uh, we don't know the answer to that. So no one knows really how to do quantum gravity. So uh, what I'm going to do is to describe that quest. I mean, you, this is as a series of ideas uh, that, uh, that are motivated by this efforts to understand gravity at a quantum level. And uh, one of the interesting ideas that have come out of this is this uh, idea of holography. And it's a very radical and revolutionary idea, I would say. And um, although it's not, it's not something that has been. It's, a, it's items one and two are basically stuff that you can find in textbooks. I mean, not all of you may have read everything in that, but it's fairly well established. Uh, item number four is fairly speculative. That's the holographic principle, which I will get to, and sort of transitioning from textbook stuff to speculative stuff is this black hole. Of course, the black hole has aspects of it which are completely well established as an astrophysical object. But there are many aspects of the black hole theory uh, which uh, are not fully understood. <laughs> so here's the beginning. So let me begin by saying that quantum mechanics and relativity were two scientific revolutions that took place in the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, Everyone knows that. So quantum mechanics. Initially, at least it was an experimental uh, development. It dealt with atoms and other small atomic sized systems and slow moving particles. All the initial experiments involved slow moving particles. Okay. Uh, on the, the other new idea that came around at that time, so this uh, rel the special relativity, which deals with fast objects, with object speeds near the speed of light. Okay. So these are two independent developments. One is quantum mechanics dealing with small objects and special relativity dealing with fast objects. And then you can ask the question, what happens when you have entities that are both small and fast? Okay, so you have to combine the two. So you could have uh, fast moving electrons interacting with photons. So the electron is fast moving. When I say fast, it means speeds near the speed of light. and uh, Photon is obviously moving at the speed of light. And uh, these two were combined in a beautiful framework called quantum electrodynamics. Okay? QED, it's called. And uh, this is one of the most accurate theories in the world because you can compare, you can calculate quantities, and it agrees with experiments to something like one part in 10 to the power of 11. So that's an amazingly successful theory, quantum electrodynamics. And here are the people who founded these are well-known names. They got the Nobel Prize in the 60s. That's Tomonaga on the left, Julian Schwinger. Um, so he was at UCLA when we were there. And Feynman, he was at Caltech. So uh, 
And they got the Nobel Prize, I think, in the 60s for the work on quantum electrodynamics. So as I said, it's one of the most successful theories and it gave people confidence in this formalism. So this, this formalism uh, I've mentioned here is generically called relativistic quantum field theories. So the words are easy to understand. It's a field theory like uh, because if you're talking about electromagnetic fields, it's quantum because it's quantum mechanical and relativistic because we're talking about particles that move fast. And the same kind of field theories were also uh, turned out to describe the strong interactions and the weak interactions. So all this is described by what is now referred to as the standard model. This is a phrase that you might hear often. So it's a standard model. It uses this mathematical formalism of relativistic quantum field theories to describe electromagnetism, strong interactions, and weak interactions with great accuracy. Okay. By the way, if I say anything that's not clear, please stop me. I mean, there's no problem. I mean, you can ask as many questions as you want. Okay, so uh, so what I've told you so far is the success success story. If you now uh, try to do this for general relativity, what is general relativity? So I talked about special relativity. The other development, again, uh, also called relativity, is Einstein's general relativity, and uh, that was Einstein's name for a theory of gravity. He called it general relativity. So so the this uh, success that we, we did for electrodynamics has not succeeded for gravity. So we don't know how to do that quantum mechanically. Okay? So I said, this doesn't work. This means, what does this mean? It means making it quantum mechanical. And I'll explain in a few lines what that means later on. OK, now why it doesn't work, I cannot tell you in detail, because that requires uh, knowledge about the formalism of quantum field theory, which we don't have. But I can uh, roughly, uh, I can give you an idea. So uh, we can get a rough idea if you understand what it means to take a classical theory, for instance, electromagnetism, and make it quantum mechanical. What do you mean when you say, take this theory and make it quantum mechanical? Well, what it means is, it means the following. So if you take a classical variable, what is a classical variable? You study uh, Newtonian mechanics. You have particle moving, and the position of that particle is your variable, position and momentum. In quantum mechanics, that variable can fluctuate. See, classically, it follows an equation of motion. The particle follows a trajectory. Quantum mechanically, the thing can fluctuate. That's the main effect of quantum mechanics. Similarly, you have an electromagnetic field. It obeys Maxwell's equation. So you have solutions, you know, sine, omega, t, et cetera, et cetera. But quantum mechanically, it doesn't have to obey the equation of motion all the time. It can fluctuate. Okay. So taking account of those fluctuations, uh, that means to say you have configurations of the field that don't obey the classical equations of motion. That's what it means to make it quantum mechanical. So you have to consider all those configurations. So now if the fluctuations are very small and rare, then uh, it's easy to deal with it. You can do the calculation in some approximation. But in gravity, it turns out it's very large. It's not, it's large. Okay. Fluctuations turn out to be very large. And why it is large, it's difficult for me to explain in words, but it, it's just a fact. It comes from the formalism when you, when you start doing the calculation. And actually, uh, I can say one thing. So naively, uh, we know that gravity also obeys inverse square law. You know, the force of Newtonian attraction. It falls off as 1 over r squared. Electrostatics is also 1 over r squared. So superficially, they're very similar. Okay? But there's one big difference. Uh, in uh, electromagnetism, like charges repel and unlike charges attract. Right? We all know that. But in gravity, it's always attractive. And related to this is the uh, fact that uh, maybe you know is that the a particle that you call the photon, which is responsible for electromagnetism, has spin one. Analogously, the particle that is responsible for gravitation has spin two. So that's a big difference. Okay, it turns out that makes all the difference and uh, makes gravity fluctuations very large. And this quantization that you did for electromagnetism doesn't work for gravity. 
So that's the thing, uncontrollable fluctuations. Okay. Now, uh, one suggestion that people have made to, to sort of to tame these fluctuations, to make them under control, is to use something called string theory. You may have heard in popular uh, literature that string theory is a, a new uh, approach to quantum gravity. So I, I say it's possibly a consistent quantum theory of gravity. Okay, It's not... I mean, I should say that when you give a popular talk like this, you say something which you uh, which represents a viewpoint. Not everything is established. There are multiple viewpoints. So you 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 will find someone saying that string theory is wrong. You will find people saying that quantum gravity is uh, has to be done this way. But uh, so I'm 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 sort of saying that there's a large number of people who think that string theory is the correct way to quantize quantum gravity, but there are also people who have other opinions. So you, when you give, when you listen to a popular talk, you should always take everything with a little bit of salt when, when they're talking about things that are not been, not textbook stuff. So there are other approaches to gravity also, but uh, string theory certainly takes care of the fluctuations. Okay, so that part is solved. Whether it is the correct theory of quantum gravity is the jury is still out. So what is, I'm not going to talk much about string theory. It just says it goes beyond usual quantum field theory, which deals with point particles. String theory deals with one dimensional objects. Okay. But the interesting thing is, many of the qualitative ideas that I'm going to talk in this talk, that I'm going to say in the, discuss in this talk, requires string theory to make them very mathematically precise. So string theory is a very well-defined theory that you can, as I said, you can control all those quantum fluctuations. You can calculate quantities. And uh, um, the many things that you can calculate using string theory that you can't calculate otherwise. But I'm not going to discuss string theory today. Just keep it in your back of your mind that many of these results come out of string theory. So now we turn to gravity. OK, so here are the two heroes of gravity. There's Newton and there's Einstein. Uh, they're both great physicists, but just as an aside, if you read their biographies, you'll realize that they're very different personalities. Einstein was a very, very warm, generous person. Newton was an extremely aggressive, uh, sort of uh, unpleasant personality. Yeah, it's very interesting, his life. He used to, he would never give credit to anyone. Uh, I mean, he wanted to take all the credit for himself. But anyway, he, he's still, we think of him as, the greatest mathematician, one of the greatest physicists, and so on. So his work is, of course, beyond reproach. So our story begins with Isaac Newton and then turns to Einstein. So, OK, so here's the uh, equation that everyone knows. So I've combined two equations. This is his famous second law. That's the uh, Newton's law of uh, gravitation. and um, so G is Newton's constant. These constants will occur again. And using, using this, you get an equation for this A. And the interesting thing uh, is this. The M's cancel. See, that there's an M here and an M here. Now, you might ask, uh, well, it's obvious that they should cancel. But it's, it's not so obvious, because who told you that this, this is an inertial mass, the resistance to motion. This is a gravitational, so it's the how strong it, it's attracted by gravity. Why should they be the why should they be equal? It's an experimental fact that they're equal, and Newton took them to be equal. So then the ends cancel. Okay. Why are the ends the same? So what Einstein did, amongst other things, was to uh, raise this as a principle. In fact, it, he called it the equivalence principle. It's called the weak equivalence principle. There's also a strong equivalence principle. And he said that inertial mass and gravitational mass are equal. So that what you put here and what you put there are equal. And that's why this acceleration doesn't depend on the mass of the particle, which is an experimental fact. So how does this help? Well, he, he did the following. And here's a figure that you will get all taken from the internet. He said, there's a way to understand why the acceleration doesn't depend on the mass. And the way to see that is to say that what, gravi what gravity does is it curves the space around it. 
Okay, so I've drawn a, you can't draw three dimensional thing. So I've drawn a, a cartoon two dimensional thing. So here's something like the earth and here's the a sort of a sheet which is going down under its weight. You can think of that as the curved space around the earth. And uh, this line trajectory here, so if you start from here and go there, this represents the shortest curve from this point to that point in this geometry. Okay? Shortest curve. If this were flat, if, this were, if there was no earth and this was flat, then that would be a straight line. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But on this geometry, the shortest distance is not a straight line, it's a curve. And what Einstein said was that the big object curves space-time around it. All the small objects follow the same geodesic trajectories in the space-time. And the geodesic connecting two points is the curve with the least length. Okay, so what he did was to say that gravity was reduced to geometry. So all you have to know is how the, the mass curves the space around it, calculate, take two points. If you know the geometry, you can calculate the shortest length and that's the trajectory the particle will follow. And it doesn't matter what the mass of the particle is, they're all going to go on that trajectory, whether it's a small particle or a big particle. Of course, Special relativistic corrections. So now we move on to classical gravity and quantum mechanics. So here it's important that I'm talking about uh, classical gravity and quantum mechanics. So I'm trying to combine the two, but I'm not saying quantum gravity. That's different. Okay. So classical gravity and quantum. So let's, uh, so quantum mechanics is a spectacularly successful theory. Every experiment supports the correctness of the theory in flat space time. What does flat space mean? It means weak gravity. Does quantum mechanics work in strong space or very strong gravitational fields? Uh, we believe it does, but that has not really been tested experimentally. Okay, so one again, this is something that everyone knows, but I uh, should mention this is a, where does one place? So this is a prelude to black holes. Where does all where do all these things play a role? Quantum mechanics, special relativity, and gravity. Uh, it takes place in when you study stellar collapse of objects like white dwarfs. So as you know, Chandrasekhar showed that stars more massive than a certain value, collapse under their own gravitational weight. Uh, the outward pressure of the matter is not able to match the inward gravitational force. And this, the fact that it's not able to match the gravitational pull is an effect of special relativity. So that was his contribution, it was to realize that special relativity plays a role. And then he showed that the outward pressure uh, cannot 
support the gravitational force. In fact, when he gave this result, people were su surprised because they said, then what's going to happen? It's going to just collapse completely. And many famous uh, physicists at that time uh, didn't accept it. So he had, a, he had a very rough time at that time too. So this was the Chandrasekhar limit. So here is. Here's a picture again taken from the internet. So this shows the inward pressure due to gravity and the outward pressure. The origin of the outward pressure can it depends on what what stage the star is. So if you have a white dwarf, it's some something like the electron degeneracy pressure. If it's a neutron star, then it's a neutron degeneracy pressure, but something will cause that pressure. And uh, eventually, if the mass is large enough, it'll just collapse. And that was Chandrasekhar's prediction, and that's uh, that's the I, that is the first idea of a black hole. So it will collapse to a zero size or a singularity. Singularity means what? You have an infinite energy. Yeah. Inward pressures, gravity, outward pressures. If you try to squeeze a matter, it resists that, right? Because you're trying. What are you trying to? You're trying to force the atoms together, then you're forcing uh, protons together, so there's a repulsion. At In a white dwarf, there's something called the electron degeneracy pressure. So if you put a uh, lot of electrons together, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, uh, they can't all go to the same momentum state. Some of them will go to high momentum states. So the smaller the volume, the higher the uh, momentum it has to go to. So there'll be an outward pressure due to that. So, so, so depends on the actual constitution. The source of the outward pressure will be different. So that's why I said white dwarfs have one. Then, if it becomes a neutron star, then it's the neutron uh, which is behaving with, with, uh, due to this Pauli exclusion principle. So that will give you a different number. But eventually, uh, nothing can uh, prevent the collapse, and you get a black hole. So singularity means you have uh, all that mass concentrated in zero volume. So its density is infinite. Whenever something is infinite, it's a, called a singularity. So you say that if something is infinite, then your theory is breaking down. You can't calculate at that point. Okay, so Tail radius. So that's the standard picture of a black hole. So there's a singularity. So here also there's a singularity. Uh, and it's black. Why is it black? Because the attraction is so strong that nothing can come out. Okay, so, it's, so that's why it's a black hole. And that's the event horizon. It's called the event horizon. And this is the short cell radius. And again, you've seen these pictures in all over the place. Uh, there's plenty of experimental evidence by now. So this picture you've seen in many talks. So now a black hole is black. So now we're going to, so far everything I've told you is sort of textbook stuff. Uh, now we're going to talk about, again, things which are approaching the speculative. Uh, so some of you, I think some of you may know about this. There is a problem if you have a event horizon in which nothing can come out. Once you put something in, if nothing can come out, that means even light rays can't come out. You don't know what's in there. So, it's, so this can be problematic. Why is it problematic? Because uh, this was pointed out, I think, first by Bekenstein, that uh, you can violate the second law of thermodynamics by dropping matter and entropy into a black hole. So the entropy of the universe decreases because you drop some hot sub thing into that, but it's gone inside the black hole and you'll never see it again. No one will ever see it again. So it looks like the entropy uh, decreases, but that violates the second law. And Jacob Bekenstein found a way 
out of this. Here he is. What he said, again, this is uh, more or less well known by now, is that he said you can assign an entropy to the black hole to rescue the second law of thermodynamics. So although you can't see what's inside the black hole, he said we'll assign an entropy to it just to make sure that the second law is not violated. And he calculated, and I won't give the calculation. You may have seen it somewhere, I don't know. But he said that it's proportional to the area of the, A is the area of that surface, so it's something like 4 pi r squared, and g is again Newton's constant. So this is an important point. So for us, this is an important point because this is what leads to the idea of holography, that this is a three-dimensional object. And you think that the entropy would be proportional to the amount of, to the volume of that, like if you have a gas or something. But it's proportional to the area. It doesn't seem to know what's inside. It's not proportional to the volume. Uh, now, uh, some more about the black hole. And again, uh, this leads uh, me towards the idea of holography. Also, it gives you an idea of combining relativity with gravity, which I talked about. But again, this is classical gravity. This is a famous calculation by Hawking, Stephen Hawking. He said that if something has entropy, then thermodynamics says it has to have a temperature. And he calculated the temperature. Here's Stephen Hawking. And uh, he said that if it's at finite temperature, it should radiate like a black body. Okay. Anything hot has to radiate. So if Bekenstein said it has a, in fact, Hawking was trying to disprove Bekenstein because he wanted to say that it, it can't have a temperature because the black holes don't radiate. So then he decided to do a calculation and he found that indeed, due to quantum effects, it radiates. Hawking calculated this and showed that it does radiate like a hot body at precisely the correct temperature that is required to agree with Bekenstein's formula. So, uh, his calculation used quantum mechanics in an essential way, because as I said, in quantum mechanics, there's always a fluctuation. You can have things that are not allowed classically. Quantum mechanics, there's a finite probability for processes that are not allowed classically. One such process is pair production in the vacuum. So that means classically, you have just have a vacuum. Quantum mechanically, uh, all the time, there are electron-positron pairs that are pr being produced and annihilated. You produce them and annihilate them. That's happening all the time, quantum mechanically. So this is what happens. Again, you may have seen this, these kind of illustrations. So there's a black hole. So here are the pair product pr production going on. But every once in a while, when the pair production happens near the event horizon, one of them may go through this horizon, this path may take it through that, and then it can't come out. It can't recombine with this guy. So this guy will go out, this guy will go in. Okay, so this, this is an explicitly quantum mechanical effect. And uh, this is the mechanism of Hawking radiation. But I should emphasize again that this is quantum mechanics, but gravity is still classical. I have not done any quantum gravity so far. It's just a combination of quantum mechanics and gravity, but not quantum gravity. So, uh, so quantum mechanics and general relativity. So, why general relativity? Because this black hole solution comes out of general relativity, and you can't use Newtonian gravity to calculate this. Combine nicely to maintain internal consistency of the theory. Now, the interesting thing, the event horizon has all the entropy. That is, Bekenstein said. Not only that, it radiates like a hot body. So the three-dimensional black hole acts as if all the degrees of freedom are at the two-dimensional horizon. If all the entropy is on the horizon, that means the degrees of freedom is what contributes to entropy. So they're all sitting at the horizon. So it has a two-dimensional horizon. This is similar to holography. So the idea of holography arose from this. It, uh, it was first made by... Uh, a Toft, a physicist by the name of Toft, and also Susskind. At that time, it was not taken very seriously because it seemed uh, exotic, but now we take it very seriously. So, and this has been elevated to the status of a principle called the holographic principle. Okay. So, at this point, I'm transitioning from textbook facts about black holes to somewhat speculative facts about black holes.
So this is a picture that is often made. So uh, you know, the, uh, these ones and zeros are supposed to de denote information bits in digit in binary. It's one and zero. So you have to imagine a sphere where there are uh, small sizes, very small, from some scale in which. Uh, decided by gravity, which is like 10 to the power of minus 33 centimeter. It's called the Planck length. You know, if you take Newton's constant and try to make a, a length out of it by combining it with uh, the other constants like h bar and c, there's one unique way you can combine. If you, and if you plug in all the numbers, it'll come out as 10 to the power of minus 33 centimeters. So it's called a Planck length. So the idea is that um, you take the area of this horizon in in units of the Planck length squared, and um, you'll have so many little, little squares, and each place you put a bit, one or zero, and that's the information, that's the, that's the information in the black hole, and information is related to entropy. Oh, so I was just telling you, uh, com contrast this or compare this with holography. So this is, uh, if you know about holography, so here's the, or, object. This is a three-dimensional object. Why is it called holography? It's a three-dimensional object. You illuminate it with a coherent beam, like a, from a laser, and you let it in, uh, you split the beam, ref reflect on the mirror, and it, this interferes with that coherently, and you get an interference pattern on this photographic plate. Okay, This interference pattern is on a two-dimensional plate, but it has all the information about that three-dimensional object. Here it is. You can reproduce. You know how holo you've seen holograms. Uh, I mean, in work and in, in news channels and all that, they make these things. So if you shine light on this uh, coherent beam on this two-dimensional plate and look at it from here, you will see that image. So all the information. And uh, by the way, this is not just a surface. If you're if you use some uh, waves which are which can penetrate. You can see the insides also. People do that in medicine, right? They do these scans. So you can make a complete three-dimensional image of that can be stored on this two-dimensional plate. So here's a picture of the plate, photographic plate on some scale. This doesn't look anything like that object, right? It's just some pattern. But somehow all that information is stored here. So this, so philosophically, this is equivalent to that. This is equivalent to that because that, you can go from that to this in a unique way. So all the information is there. So all the visual information about a three-dimensional object is stored on a two-dimensional photographic film. If you look at the image on that photographic plate, it doesn't look anything like that object. So the holographic principle says that all the information in the three-dimensional black hole is present on the event horizon. Okay? This is consistent with Bekenstein's formula that entropy is proportional to the area of the horizon. And uh, just a note on the, the idea of information. Now we've, I've used the word information and I've used the word entropy. They're actually interchangeable. If you, if you know uh, information theory, the father of information theory is Sh Shannon. If you're, uh, he defined information as PI log PI. Basically, it's saying that if you know with, with great probability what the next bit is going to be, then you're not getting any information. So it, it's, the, it's the uncertainty. When you get something that's not certain to come, that's when you get information. Okay? So the more disorderly something is, the more information you need to describe that. I mean, if I have, give you a series of ones, all one, 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 it doesn't require any information to describe that. I can just say there are 100 ones. But if you have random collection of ones and zeros, that's a lot of information. Okay? So Disorder is entropy is actually equivalent to information. So this is so the word is counterintuitive. One when you say information, it doesn't sound like it should be disorder, but actually disorder is the more disorder, the more information you have. Because and the formula is more or less the same. That's the formula for the entropy in physics. Rho is a density matrix, and if you know density matrices, uh, if you assume they're all it's a diagonal with pi, this will be just equal to that. Okay. And that's just a technical aside. But anyway, the point is, when Bekenstein said the entropy, he, it's actually the information. So far, we've seen the interplay between quantum mechanics, relativity, and classical gravity leads to the Chandrasekhar limit and to black holes. These are described by Einstein's equation. 
and consistency with the second law gave rise to the Bekenstein entropy area formula for black holes and this suggested the holographic principle. But I have not given a precise statement so far in this talk. That requires string theory. Now, what is the precise statement of holography? Because so far I have just talked about entropy of a black hole. So string theory actually gives a very precise statement. Uh, and string theory is also required for quantum gravity. So, so far I haven't talked about quantum gravity. So yeah, I'm just repeating that. So we've been studying quantum mechanics of matter in a classical gravitational field, okay, which where the classical gravitational field could be described by Einstein's uh, general relativity or Newton's theory. That's a different issue. But we're talking about quantum mechanics of matter in a classical field. So now I'm going to now, uh, and I've also told you that the new thing that happens when you make something quantum mechanical is that it has finite probability to fluctuate and take values not allowed by the classical equations. So in quantum gravity, the gravitational field fluctuates and does very wild non-classical things. That's very difficult to deal with. Okay. And I also told you this, a strong candidate for a consistent theory of quantum gravity is string theory. Okay. Now, string theory, I'm not going to talk about string theory, but it started uh, the modern version of string theory started in 84. In 97, a very dramatic, 97 or 98, I don't remember, very dramatic uh, discovery was made by this physicist, Maldesina, who's at the uh, Institute, Institute for Advanced Study now. He was a graduate student when he did this. It's something called the ADS CFT correspondence. Okay, that's just a, another word for holography. But he made a very precise statement. And I'm going to just tell you that statement. The details are not important. So uh, the, the what I told you so far was about black holes. This is not specifically about black holes. It's more general, and that's where uh, the, that's where the dramatic part comes. So he said that there's a very precise duality. Duality means what? The two things which are equal. Duality between a specific theory with gravity in a four plus one dimensional space time. Uh, the one always refers to time. When we say we are in three space and one time, we talk about it as three plus one dimensional space time. So he was talking about a four plus one dimensional space time. In his example, he had a very precise example of a gravity in four plus one dimensional space time. And he said this is dual or equivalent in the sense that the holographic, photographic plate was equivalent to that a uh, three-dimensional object. Uh, there's another theory which lives on the three plus one dimensional boundary of this four plus one dimensional space. So if you have a, you know, if you have a four-dimensional object, its boundary will be three. The boundary always has one dimension less than the bulk, right? So the boundary of this four-dimensional object is a three-dimensional uh, object. Time is there in both. So what he proposed a very took a specific theory in this four plus one dimensional theory, which had gravity and other mm, interactions. And he said, and he took another theory on the boundary, which didn't have gravity. And he said, these are precisely the same theories, but different language. Photographic plate. Right, right. So, means how you make sure that in the lower dimension you are carrying all the information about the system is retained uh so in the photographic plate we know it does because we are yeah, able to read that re you can say yeah. is a precise so, here, experiment. so here uh here so that's a good question because that's why this thing has not been proven yeah that's what it's not been proven but uh the evidence uh, all the calculations wherever you can do calculations mm -hmm. it matches very nicely everything here matches precisely with that so, uh, and uh, what and is the meaning of matching? Ms. Oh, oh, so I, I uh, so when I said, so Maldachina gave, Ma, actually Maldachina and then, oops, sorry, where am I? Yeah. So Ma, Maldachina gave a very precise statement of the duality. So he, he gave a prescription that, oh, so let me write down. So I'll just say a few more things. So he said that this, 4 plus 1 dimensional space is, uh, is what is called an anti dissiter space. So people who are familiar with some cosmology of gravity will recognize this word. It's some special curved space which has some peculiar geometry. 
And on the boundary, he said there's a conformal field theory. So that's also one of those field theories like electromagnetism, which has a property that it is conformal invariant. That's a kind of invariance, scale invariance. And uh, he also specified what the theory was here. And I, I think I've, I've said that it's actually uh, what is called N equals four Yang-Mills theory on the boundary. That's a special kind of theory. I think I've said that. Let me show it here. Yeah. So the two theories are very different. The boundary theory, he had a prescription, which is N equals four Yang-Mills, which is a Yang-Mills theory means it's like a QCD theory of strong interactions, very similar theory. The bulk theory is a gravity theory with a lot of extra fields. Okay? And you can do calculations in the boundary theory. What can you calculate in a field theory? You can calculate various correlation functions and things. You can get that same answer by forgetting about the boundary theory and doing the calculation in the bulk. He gave a prescription how to calculate using the gravity theory, quantities in the boundary theory, and vice versa. So there's a mathematical dictionary, uh, field theory quantities, gravity quantities. There's a one-to-one -one map. So wherever you can do, so these are calculations which a priori had no reason to agree, but amazingly it agreed to the finest detail. Yeah. It is hiding the secrets. Exactly. And another part, it is revealing the secrets. Yes, yes. And then you are doing the mapping. That's right. I don't know. So I, I will, in fact, uh, in my few slides later, I will, I'll try to demystify it a little bit. And maybe it'll, you'll be, be a little happier then. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? This principle is true for any arbitrary n dimensions or only for n. Oh, uh, wait, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, this. Uh, Ah, that n equals 4 was not referring to the dimension. It was referred, there's something called a supersymmetric theory. There's n equals 1, super, so 4 supersymmetry. That n equals 4 refers to 4. But that is a, that theory is written in 3 plus 1 dimensions, 4 dimensions. And the bulk theory is a 5-dimensional theory, 4 plus 1 dimensions. But there are other examples also that are known. And uh, uh, all of them are examples taken from string theory where the no, correspondence is known very precisely. But people have since generalized to many other situations where you start with one dimension and go to two dimensions, two dimensions, go to three dimensions, so three-dimensional gravity and two-dimensional field theory. So there are many such examples. And a lot of things which a priori had no reason to work out match very nicely. So anti -dissiter, so the dissiter space is... Means, oh, uh, why we cannot have that uh, mapping in some other... Dissiter. Yeah. Uh, anti dissiters okay, so maybe when I talk about my demystification, it will become clear. Okay, thank you. So let me show you this picture. I think it's here. Oh, it's, no, where is that picture? Ah, this is an image taken from the internet. So, uh, so what is special about anti dissiter becomes clear here. So this is, this, it's like a, so we imagine a cylinder, the boundary is, Boundary of the cylinder is where your conformal field, th field theory sits. The field theory, which is similar to some strong interaction theory. Okay, so it has no gravity. In inside, which I've drawn with all these colorful triangles, is the four plus one dimensional bulk. So that one dimension is the time. That's there for everyone. But the space here is one dimensional less than the space inside. Obviously, it's a bulk and a boundary. And here, there's a gravity theory. And the anti dissiter nature is shown by these the tilings. See, the tiles are getting bigger as you go towards the center and getting smaller as you go towards the boundary. So that's the property of anti dissiter space. Further out you go, there's a shrinking of the size. And, um, okay, so I, okay, so let me just say this. So the two, I, I'll come back to that in a minute. The two theories are very different. Boundary theory is N equals four angles, is like QCD. Uh, so the duality, relates a theory without gravity to a theory with gravity. So superficially, there's no connection, just like the photographic plate and the 3D image. But this area of research has been very active and many such examples have been found. But it's still a conjecture without proof. When I say found, I mean found where, in the sense that many things that you calculate match. You find a pair of theories, you calculate in this, calculate in that, it matches. Um, and it supports this holographic principle, but People have not proved it. When you prove it, when you say prove, it means everything has to match. It's not just things that you're able to calculate. You have to say that you're guaranteed that the two will match. Right? That's a proof. Proofs are very hard. 
but there's so much evidence by now that everyone takes it very seriously. This, uh, yes. System. Yes. So that's an example. In fact, that quark blue and plasma example was the thing that actually made this very popular because yeah. <clears throat> so it's a it's still a conjecture without proof, but no one really doubts it. It's such a it works in such amazing ways that it, it, it's like, it, how can it not be true? I mean, otherwise, it would, there was no way it would have worked. It wasn't true. So, one, now, so I'm going to say something about demystifying this. This is related to some work that some of us are doing. One interesting aspect of this correspondence is suggested by the figure. So, so this is the fact. Notice that the size of the basic unit triangular region increases as you go inward. I showed you that. This is a property of anti dissertative geometry. Okay? The unit of length gets bigger as you go towards the center. And, uh, okay, I'm, I'll be well in time. Yeah. The unit of length gets bigger as you go towards the center, and the distance between two points, as expressed in these units, decreases. Okay, so it's like if, you, if your ruler is getting, so if I say the distance between two points is, uh, say, two meters, and then I use a, a ruler stick my unit becomes two meters, then in, in those units, that distance becomes one. So the unit will decide what number you get for the distance. So here, the unit of length gets bigger as you go towards the center, and the distance between two points, as expressed in these units, decreases. Well, it's log in some units. It's actually... Um, um, it's the the distance can be treated. I'll I'll say that in a minute. Yeah. So if you're familiar, so uh, now this is a technical thing. Uh, if you're not familiar, it doesn't matter. I'll just say it in words. Uh, high energy physicists and condensed matter physicists know something called the renormalization group transformation. I don't know if, if people are familiar with this, but the uh, the renormalization what does this renormalization group transformation do? It's a technical word for coarse graining. Okay, so you you have some um, you're trying to describe some let's say some matter like a crystal or something. Now you can look at it at short. You can go very close to it and look at it at short distance, or you look at it from a distance. When you look at it from a distance, you will only see some averages. You won't see the details. So that process is called coarse graining. You average out some. So if you have many spins, for instance, in like a ferromagnetic system, you take a region and average all the spins and replace it by one big spin. Okay, so that process is called coarse graining and there's a well-defined procedure for doing that and it's a very powerful technique for uh, calculating quantities. Okay? Because in for most practical purposes, we are not interested in looking at the, the, the two atoms in a crystal. We want to see gross properties like conductivity or you know how the uh, uh, material properties of that. Which, which are things that you measure on macroscopic experiments. You're not really interested in the microscopic details. So to go from that microscopic detail to this large distance uh, description, you have to do some averaging. And when you average, you change your variables to average quantities. And then you write your theory in terms of those average variables, and the theory looks very different. Okay? So that process mathematically is called the renormalization group. And that extra dimension, uh, so in the of the bulk theory, has an interpretation uh, as this uh, scale, the scale at which you're calculating anything. So uh, this is an idea that I, I don't know whether you have, but when you when you when you when you, whenever you calculate something, let's say in strong interactions, say that's a very 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 dramatic, the behavior of the theory at Long distances, that means if you measure, so for instance, if you take QCD, strong interactions, you, it's described in terms of quarks and, uh, I'm sorry, protons and neutrons in, in a gross way. But if you probe it at short distances or at high energies or high temperatures, it becomes a quark gluon plasma. Right? So the theory looks very different at, uh, at high energies than it does at low energies. At low energies, it looks like neutrons and protons. So that difference is what you study by studying the renormalization group. You start with the theory at something, and then you take a, uh, average quantities, and you find that at long distances, it looks like protons and neutrons. At short distances, it like, looks like quarks and gluons. 
So that process of going from that picture to this picture is called the renormalization group transformation. There's a mathematical way of doing it, it's a systematic way of doing it. So how far you've gone in that direction is called the scale. So in QCD, uh, the proton has a mass of about 1 GeV. Right? That's and the size of some uh, one Fermi or something. If you probe it at very short distances, much inside the proton, you'll see quarks and gluons. And if you probe it at longer distances, you'll see the proton. So the scale at which you probe it is the scale at which you will get an answer. It will depend on the uh, the answer you get will depend on the scale at which you probe it. So that scale is some is your choice. What scale I choose to ask the question? Am I going to ask questions at low energies or high energies? So that choice is represented by that uh, radius, radial dimension. So in some sense, this demystifies holography because why? Because all that the boundary theory actually has a lot of information which is not obvious. So for instance, if, you, if I give you Yang Mills theory and say this is strong interactions, it's not obvious that at short distances it's going to look like protons and neutrons. It's, it's, you, you, I give you a theory of quarks and gluons, but at short, at long distances, it looks like protons and neutrons. That's not at all obvious. Looks, but uh, it's true because when you do the calculation, that's what happens. So somehow, somehow, suppose you took this QCD theory and uh, wrote it, in, uh, rewrite it in variables where all this information is is in front of you. That at high energy it behaves this way, at low energy it behaves this way. And then you you're describing uh, the theory at all different scales then obviously it's going to require many more variables. So that's the extra dimension. So you're taking the same information and you spread it out a bit so that more things are visible, more information is available. So that's the, and that's exactly what happens in this photographic plate. The photographic plate has information in two dimensions, but it actually has information about the 3D. It's all, I mean, all the, uh, the photographic plate has some, way of storing that information, you work on it and you spread it out and it looks like the three-dimensional image. Same thing here, the field theory has some information which is in some form. You spread it all out, it's like you take a file and you unzip it or zip it. When you zip it, it's small, unzip it, it becomes big. So the boundary theory is like the zipped version. The bulk theory is where all this information about how the theory behaves at different scales is made manifest. And uh, it so obviously requires an extra dimension to see that. So this is an uh, area of research where you can try and maybe using the ideas from the re renormalization group, you may be able to prove that such a holographic principle is, is true. So now I'm ready to summarize. So we've so what has all got this got to do with quantum gravity? Well, the connection is that all this came out of string theory. And the real motivation for string theory was to make a consistent theory of quantum gravity. As I told you, quantum gravity, the fluctuation is a very wild, the usual procedures don't work. But once you say it's part of a string theory, calculations are well-defined, and out comes this holographic principle in string theory, which was already speculated for black holes in the 80s because of this entropy being on the surface. So in the black hole case, it was just, uh, uh, it was just applied to black holes, but when you try to quantize gravity and use string theory as a quantum theory of gravity, this holographic principle pops out. And it seems to work in, in, in the most amazing way. And um, although it has not been proved, um, it's, it's, it seems to, be, seems to be true. You know, a lot of things in physics are very, for instance, in, if you take quantum chromodynamics, it's a confining theory that you, you don't see free quarks, but it's not, Provable. I mean, it's, at least no one has proved it. It's very hard to prove. So many things are true which you can't prove. Yeah, it's almost like an axiom. Yeah, but I mean, people have tried to prove it. I mean, in the uh, I think in the early 80s, Tombolis gave a proof of confinement. It was right, but there were some technical issues which people are not happy with. So as of now, no one is satisfied with that proof. So as of now, there is no proof of confinement. But we know things confine. So, yeah. Yes. No, that's just a, a one and zero is just a illustration. It's like a cartoon. How the information is stored there, we don't, we don't really know. Though string theory uh, actually uh, gives some detail about that. 
Yeah. So if there is like information like this, for yes. example, so is there any system that we can reverse engineer it and uh, form the objects like holograms by just putting the information for the surface? Uh, you, you mean, can you recreate the black hole by knowing this information? Any miniature size object, uh, not just black hole. Like we just input the information of that particular surface, then it will reverse engineer it and form that particular objects in the real 3D world. Oh no no the wait the 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 hollow in 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 a, in the black hole what we're saying is that there is some information on one surface which has information about the thing inside it but uh, it's not that I I take this uh, I take this and all the information about this is on this surface that just happens for the black hole it just happens to be true for the black hole but for a general object that surface is not the real surface of that it, it need not be. Uh, I mean, let me uh, maybe put it another way. Uh, the information on the surface is not what I see on the surface. It, it's something else. It's represented some other way. So if that three-dimensional object, for instance, you had a photographic plate for that three-dimensional object, right? The, the material on that plate, what you see, is nothing like the surface of that three-dimensional object. It's just a different representation. So a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. But that two-dimensional uh, surface is not the boundary of that three-dimensional object. Okay. But that happens in in this uh, holographic, in this ADS CFT. It happens that you take this uh, cylindrical space on the boundary. You put information which is uh, different in a different form from the information in the bulk. So the boundary, the field theory is com is completely different from the field theory in the bulk. So the information in the boundary is in a completely different form. So if you, if you want to recreate, you have to do a very elaborate map to go from this to that. The map that the map that you this suggests yes. ADS CFT to GRT. Yes. GRT transformation. Yes. This is only in a limited sense, right? It is not going to give you like something like uh, QC Naitas theorem or the consult. No, it's exact. Exact. Yeah, it's a, right? the two the two theories. On the boundary and the bulk, oh. the completely different theories. One is uh, an equals four Yang Mills. In the bulk, it's some supergravity string theory. But does it give octet law on uh, interactions? It will give everything. Everything is a complete equivalent. That's why uh, it's an exact principle. String theory gives an exact principle. Yeah. Yes. So what would be the uh, holographic principle? I mean. Ah, oh, this is not a black hole. Yeah, if I consider a naked singular. Yeah, I, so holographic principle now has been generalized beyond black holes. Mm -hmm. So originally it was started from black holes, mm -hmm. but now this uh, principle doesn't. So this this statement that I made here, there's no reference to any black hole. Okay. So you, now you can just ask the question: What happens if there's a singularity in the bulk? How will it show up in the boundary? I mean, I don't know. That's a, but you can ask that question. Yeah, yeah, they, because there is no surface. Uh, there is no surface. Right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, that's why I don't know that how this holo. Yeah, yeah but I, as I said, the, the new version of the holographic, so that holographic principle about the horizon containing the surface was the earlier version mm -hmm. just for black holes. I see. But this holographic principle doesn't say anything about black holes. That was a, like a special case of this. So here we just have an anti dissider space. There's no necessarily, there's no black hole inside. Or there could be a black hole, but it's not necessary. But the boundary is the boundary of that space. So now you, if you ask a question, if, is there a singularity? How will it show in the boundary theory? That's a question that you can pose and you can try and answer. Uh, offhand, I don't know the answer. Okay. But it's a well posed question. Yeah. Thank you. A very hypothetical ah, question. Yeah, sure. You said in the beginning of your talk that uh, on the horizon. Yes. Uh, if a pair production takes place, yes, yes. one goes into the black hole, other comes out. Right, right. According to the quantum principles, if I make an observation on the outside particle, it collapses. Yes. So yes. therefore, the con complementary thing should have collapsed. So I know about it. I ah. have changed the Sorry. entropy of the black hole. Yes. You are now. You are getting into the famous uh, black hole information paradox. So that's a whole uh, lecture in itself. Yeah. So that has to be resolved. So a lot of problems arise because you're using semi-classical or classical gravity with quantum mechanics. So the belief is that if you 
take the full holographic principle, you would be able to answer all these questions. So a lot of people, that's a whole area of research, how you resolve these issues. Yeah, I mean, that's precisely the... Uh, so the holographic principle is very radical, has not been proved. Efforts are underway to derive it from established principles that would provide real insight. Now, conservatively, one can just view it as a mathematical duality between two theories. Leads to very useful computational techniques. You know, I, I, I didn't say this, but it turns out that the, in many situations, the calculations in the gravity side is much simpler than the calculations in the boundary side. So it has many applications in many areas, including condensed matter physics, uh, proton structure, strong interactions, quark gluon plasma. So quark gluon plasma was was the first indication that there's something interesting here because uh, in QCD it's very hard to do calculations in QCD. It's, uh, yeah, it's non-perturbative and it's very hard to do calculations. You you have to do it on very powerful computers and all that, but uh, in uh, in this dual picture in the bulk calculation of gravity it turned out to be a very simple calculation and it agreed very well with the experiments on quark gluon plasma in brookhaven yeah yeah yes 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 the uh, derived results you agree with the lattice qcd calculation which is all order calculation in principle Oh, uh, oh, uh, so that's a good question. The, 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 no, the, it doesn't, not, the dual, see the dual, the, uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So, the, um, I'm not asking. Yes, I understand. You're talking about lattice. Non lattice calculation, if it yes. is done. Is it so, agreeing? let the, me uh, say the following thing. The duality was between N equals 4 Yang mills hmm. in the boundary and gravity in the bulk. Now, N equals 4 Yang mills is not QCD. Okay, it's it's like QCD, but it's very different. For instance, it's scale invariant. So you can ask the question, how is that duality going to be used for QCD, which is slightly different? So people have made efforts, and the answer is uh, to actually use the uh, bulk for QCD-like theories. Uh, it's very hard. Because you, you, you need actually, it works only, it, it doesn't work when the lattice is very fine. You know, you, the continuum, the, to get, you need a continuum, you need a very fine lattice to describe the real world, right? You can't have a coarse lattice. But this theory maps to a very coarse lattice in a natural way. So to get that fine uh, thing is very hard. So one of the limits, so, uh, this principle is very beautiful, but it requires uh, one theory on this side, which is, approximately realistic but not quite realistic and the uh, bulk theory is also approximately like what we have but not quite what we have and the reason these theories come out is because they have a lot of symmetries and supersymmetry and nice properties yeah. the calculation on the yeah. other side yes so my question is let us let us say condensed matter where it is not calculable at all yes such a properties uh, from first principles it cannot be shown so for, suppose for no it cannot be no it cannot be proven that's what, yeah. So you're saying, has it been proved? No, it has not been proven. But again, the qualitatively, so many experiments in condensed matter see some behavior, which they cannot explain by means of their theories on the on the lattice. But if you look at the dual picture, those behavior is very natural, comes out very easily. It's it's like generic, because the the situation where it's easy to do calculations in the bulk, it turns out it's very hard to do in the boundary. And what is easy here is difficult there. So that's the duality. It relates different regions of calculability. So that's a good point. Yeah. So as I'm saying, uh, this can be a conservative. If you're very conservative, you can just say it's a mathematical tool that you can use, just like the holographic was a tool. But uh, and it opens up a new universe of ideas. But now you can ask a very interesting question. After all, if this duality principle is true, uh, what if it's a real property for a real world? I mean, we are in a gravity theory. So are we all holograms being projected from some space at the end of the universe? So this is the picture I took from the internet. So you, you, you're, we are sitting inside there. It's a gravity theory. The holographic principle is true. There should be a theory somewhere far away 
which has no gravity, which is there, in which whatever is happening in this room is happening there also. So that's a question that uh, I'll let you think about. And uh, I think I can end the talk here. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Yeah. Calculate the entropy for the naked singularity. Entropy for the naked singularity. I, I don't know how to describe the naked singularity in, in this. Uh, I mean, I mean, just yeah. What you mentioned about the singularity. If, yeah. If it is possible to um, yeah look. I mean, if if we can observe it. Yes. Yeah. Then it is a naked singularity. Yes. But in case of the black hole, we can calculate the entropy. Yes. That's the area. Yeah. Because yeah. That's the area. Yeah. But I do not find any paper, I mean, regarding this uh, entropy for the naked singularity. That's yeah, so I don't know what theory will give a naked singularity. I mean, they are usually unphysical. As far as I know, I mean, it requires some unphysical matter to produce a naked singularity. I'm not, I mean, I know people have tried to prove it. I don't know. So ordinary matter will not give you a naked singularity. If you do some, uh, take some unphysical kind of matter, mm -hmm. unphysical in the sense, not commonly realized. Yeah. There's things people claim they can pro produce a naked singularity. Yeah. So if, I don't... So you, if the actual horizon does not form, then yeah. it is possible to observe the singularity. So I was trying to find if uh, it is yeah, possible. Yeah, but, no, no, but the, the, the area of the horizon being the entropy was specific only for black holes. Mm -hmm. For other situations, there are other ways to calculate the entropy. Um, so there, there, there are other techniques used in these holographic theories for calculating entropy of regions. Mm -hmm. So you might have to use one of those techniques to, but I don't know if anyone has ever studied a naked singularity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Universe is there. Where the other universe is a hologram. No, the the hologram, uh, the, the the plate, the photographic plate has no gravity. So our universe has gravity. So we are the higher dimension. The other dimension, the other, uh, our dual, it, it has no gravity. So it's sitting. We have gravity. There is no gravity. Holograph line, there's no gravity. And there is a mapping between these two. That's right. right. So where is the role of gravity then? Uh, no, the, these theories are completely different. You know, uh, the, 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 it's not that the, the field content of the boundary theory and the field content of the bulk theory has no connection. I mean, not that there's no connection, but the bulk has actually an infinite number of fields. So uh, if you want a little more technically, for every uh, conserved current in the boundary theory, uh, you can couple, so for instance, if you have a conserved spin one, suppose you have some global symmetry, there's a, another current for that. Coupling to a current is usually a vector, j mu, a mu, then the bulk has a gauge field. If you have an energy momentum tensor in the boundary, coupling to that is a two index field, and that'll be the graviton in the bulk. The boundary, the boundary theory has no graviton. It has an energy momentum tensor. Coupling to that is a graviton, gravity field. Similarly, you have higher spin currents, there'll be higher spin fields here. So the bulk actually has an infinite number cover of fields of various types. It's a completely different theory. And but there, there's a well-defined map to go from one to the other. But the point is it will have gravity in general. And uh, so our world is gravity. So we are we have to identify the bulk. And then the boundary theory to which we are dual will have no gravity and it will be some other theory. So that's the way it has to work. Anyway, so that raises a lot of philosophical questions. Yeah. Any questions in the YouTube? Time doesn't exist. There's only without time, without time theory can be built. Yeah, actually, uh, in gravity, time is not really there because it's a symmetry of the theory. But in these kind of theories, you can define a time on the boundary because the boundary there's no gravity. So that actually gives you a way to define time. You can associate theory with the boundary. Any questions from students? 
don't be shy. It's a chance for you to ask questions. Uh, you can also ask questions secretly if you are too shy later, but uh, I encourage you to ask now because then other people can share the answers. Right now, we are looking on the application of holograms, like in yes. technology, as we have seen in movies like um, right. Iron Man and stuff. Like it is having these gloves made of holograms and he's yes. controlling all the PC. So can it be any reality soon if we are studying these theories? Well, I don't think there's any <laughs> <laughs> connection. <laughs> I mean, because we are studying the higher dimensions and st that's why I'm asking. Yeah, that's a very far. I mean, in principle, there's a connection, but it's that's technology. This is sort of mathematics. At this level, it's just mathematics. It's hard to realize it. Uh, yeah, but it, I mean, th th that's the kind of thing that you would like to understand. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much for the very nice talk explaining the yeah, research frontier with the train terms. So yeah, so Professor Satyapana will be with us for another few weeks. So if you have a chance, uh, 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 you, you, if you are interested, you can try to interact with him. Okay, so if no more questions, let us thank the professor again.